Welcome to the sermon podcast for First St. Charles United Methodist Church in downtown St. Charles, Missouri. We are so glad that you're here, and it's our prayer that you feel safe, welcome, and wanted in this space. If you're interested in finding out more about us or supporting our ministries, you can connect with us online at firststcharlesumc.org. Today's scripture comes from the second book of Corinthians chapter 9. This is Paul addressing the church in Corinth. This is why I thought it was necessary to encourage the brothers to go to you ahead of time and arrange in advance the generous gifts you have already promised. I want it to be a real gift from you. I don't want you to feel like you are being forced to give anything. What I mean is this, the one who sows a small number of seeds will also reap a small crop. The one who sows a generous amount of seeds will also reap a generous crop. Everyone should give whatever they decide in their heart. They shouldn't give with hesitation or because of pressure. God loves a cheerful giver. God has the power to provide you with more than enough of every kind of grace. That way you will have everything you need always and in everything to provide more than enough for every kind of good work. As is written, he scattered everywhere. He gave to the needy. His righteousness remains forever. The one who supplies seed for planting and bread for eating will supply and multiply your seed and will increase your crop with just righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous in every way. Such generosity produces thanksgiving to God through us. Your ministry of this service to God's people isn't only fully meeting their needs, but is also multiplying in many expressions of thanksgiving to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Don't you love it when the word of God just really tells us how it is? Generosity brings joy. And the more generous we are, the more joy that we have, the more joy that is spread across our communities. The power of generosity does several things, as we might have learned over the past few weeks in this Say Yes stewardship. I said it again, right? Stewardship series. And I said a few weeks ago, stewardship can be fun. Are we having a good time? These Say Yes videos are amazing, aren't they? The number of things that you have truly said yes to. The power of generosity expresses our compassion by the way that we care for one another. The power of generosity makes margins, making room for us to feel the freedom that we have to give of our blessings to others. The power of generosity truly makes a difference that we understand that we each have something of value that we can give, each and every one of us. That difference that we make in our communities and the greater connection shines the light of hope, multiplies God's mission, and that we can be a part of increasing the kingdom of God. That right there should help us to say, yes, God, where do you need me? How will you use me? Your power within me opens up my heart to be generous. Ultimately, the power of generosity yields joy for us and for others. As Pastor Kate said, Jesus talked about stewardship. He talked about generosity. It's not something that Jesus wants from his followers, but rather it's something he wants for us. He doesn't want it from us. He wants it for us. You see the difference there? He wants for us to be able to express and experience and share the many blessings that we have. Jesus knows something that we don't know. He knows that generosity leads to joy and a more fulfilled life, especially our faith life, our faith journey. When we begin to trust one another, when we begin to lean on one another, when we begin to recognize how our support truly supports other people. Generosity is the pathway to true life, and the choice is ours to make. As Paul writes this letter, 
to the church in Corinth. He says, I want it to be a real gift from you. I don't want to coerce you to give. I want it to be a real gift because generosity is a free act and it is something for us. Today we have a message from the Apostle Paul to the believers in Corinth. If you've read 1st and 2nd Corinthians, you might realize that the Apostle Paul was a little miffed at the Christians in Corinth. And so he was sending these rather harsh letters to them, trying to correct their missteps along the way. But in the process, he's reminding them of the commitment that they made. They had made a commitment to the Jerusalem church, to the Christians in Jerusalem, where there was a a lot of poverty, there was a lot of need, there were widows and orphans. And so all of the communities that Paul had been creating to follow Jesus, to be worshipers of Jesus, he had asked for this gift and a commitment to that gift. Much like we stand up in times of natural disasters and crisis in our time, we desire to give to the greater good and the greater community. That's what I love about being United Methodist. We are so connected. UMCOR is one of those ways that we give. We give through our apportionments, and when we give through our apportionments, we're able to give to areas that I, as an individual, give little, but when we give that amount that we give together as one, it increases the opportunity. Your generous giving to the local church gives us the ability to truly be a blessing with the blessings that God has given us. And that brings us a sense of joy and happiness, accomplishment, that we get to participate in the kingdom possibilities simply by caring for humanity, a humanity that we may never meet, but yet we're connected, the human thread We are connected in the likeness of Jesus, one human to another, and it expands. Now Paul begins to talk about why giving in this way matters, both for the giver and those who receive the gift, and he begins to reference Proverbs 11, specifically verses 24 and 26, and he's creating this principle, this idea of it's an either-or. Last week we talked about whether, whether we give in the idea of the two servants who gave and made what they gave grow, and the one servant who buried his talent. Paul is kind of flowing in this same conversation when he lifts up these words from Proverbs 11, and he says, those who give generously receive more. Now we know that Proverbs is an ebb and flow, an either or, wisdom or folly. The next stanza says, but those who are stingy with what is appropriate will grow needy. Generous persons will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. And then Proverbs says, people... People curse those who hoard grain, but they bless those who sell it. Proverbs is truly weighing, and Paul uses this to weigh the encouragement of how we give and why we give. And I think this is why Paul uses this ancient text, because the people that he's writing to would understand this Proverbs. Paul truly wants the Corinthians to catch the vision of their financial contributions to the needs of other believers and how that can bring about spiritual results. The more they can plant with their financial discipleship out of a true heart, a heart of trueness, that Christ-like love, that spiritual blessing goes to our spiritual siblings no matter where they are. And those results of giving are not just money coming back to the Corinthians or to us, but the gift that comes in our spiritual living, the fact that joy abounds. In verse 12, Paul makes it clear that being generous is a form of service and ministry. The word that we use in in the Greek coming out of that is diakonia, right? Diakonia, service and mission. And we are a church that really lives out those missions, the increases to the kingdom that happen right here at our church. 
that we can be proud and we can celebrate the gift we give and that we continue to give through those blessings the impact that we're making on our community. It's all about God's grace and love and mercy to all, that generosity that makes us happy people. And we know this because science has shown a link between generosity and happiness. There's going to be a quote on the screen I'm going to share with you in a minute. It comes from an article from Atlanta Monthly from 2015. Uh, following a stroke, a Brazilian man uh, whose name was Joao became pathologically generous right after a stroke. He couldn't help but to give. And the article says that we've long known that there is a clear, consistent link between generosity and happiness. Surveys done around the world of many different societies have found that giving produces high levels of satisfaction and well-being in the givers. What scientists didn't have a good grasp of until recently were the neuroscientific roots of this feeling why we get a boost from giving. This article talks about brain science linking generosity to the release of things like serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, and the endorphins and the things like endorf endorphins that enhance pleasure within us, teaching us that we human beings were hardwired, we're hardwired to be generous. We're hardwired to be caring and to give, to give and to be kind and to be gracious. And I just like to say thank you, God, for hardwiring us that way. God created us to give and to be giving, to say yes, and sometimes not even knowing why we are giving. Sometimes we don't know why we're giving. We don't know why we're saying yes to what we're saying yes. But we know that when we do say yes, friends, when you said yes to Olivia to do a Say Yes video, did you not feel happy? Thinking about what you say yes to, right? I'm, I'm building you up, Olivia, because more people are going to come and say yes to you because it's going to make us happy. We have a creative God that has hardwired the connection between generosity and happiness. Most of our stories most likely are from when we received something instead of us giving. But we should turn that around and we should begin thinking about what giving teaches us within our spirits, within our hearts, within our being that gets into our brain and our heart working together that we begin to live out. Sometimes giving is a love language for some people. I don't know if you have that love language. Sometimes we have to be molded into a practice of giving. Sometimes it's something that we just have to learn and we have to move with. But the more that we give, the more that we care for others, the more that we find that the blessings are in us. God is lifting us up and God is lifting us up for the purpose of loving in community, sharing in community, being grateful in community. Now I want you to be thinking this week about a time when you gave and it wasn't easy. At a time when you kept giving and it became easier to give. I have a special needs friend who lives in a group home in, in the town of my last appointment. Uh, today I'm going to call her Pam, and Pam is now in her mid-50s, and we had a, a community meal every week at the church, and she would come to that meal, and every week she would gift me a coloring page, sometimes front and back, and it was always had a cat on it and usually a butterfly, and the color yellow, because she knew that I loved the color yellow. She knew that she would be seeing me each and every week, so she made sure as soon as she saw me to give me the coloring page. Pastor Kim, Pastor Kim, look what I colored for you with such grace and excitement. Pam loved coming over to the house and feeding Gizmo her special treats. 
A colleague and I at church began taking turns picking Pam up for weekly community meal and the activities that followed afterwards so that she would be able to be in community and to participate. And every week, Pam would ask my colleague or myself to take her to the convenience store to buy her a drink. Now the church had plenty of drinks with the meal, but she wanted to go to the convenience store and get a special drink. And at first I was reluctant to do that. I was thinking, man, I don't want to spoil her. I don't want to start doing something that is going to be a habit. How do we, how do we set boundaries around this? Is it even good for us to be taking her to do this? because she had begun texting us and asking us to go to the dollar store, to Walmart, to pick up a list of things for her. And so I became concerned that we were creating uh, um, something outside boundaries that we should be carrying. We knew that we needed to reset this relationship, but I wondered how to do it. And one, time, one day I got a text from Pam. She asked me to go pick up her fix-a-dent for her dentures. And I was reluctant. I wanted to say no. But something inside of me said, say yes. Say yes. Just go do it. And I went and I got the fix a -dent, but I bought the wrong kind. Who knew that there was about 50 kinds of fix a -dent on the shelves? Seriously, I did not know this. And it was that awkward moment where Pam was upset with me. And it gave me an open door. I'd been saying yes to her for a lot of things. But it gave us the opportunity to reset that relationship, to set some boundaries between yes and no. What can I do? You have people in your group home, their very specific purpose is to go and take you shopping. My colleague and I can't do all of this for you. But something happened over the course of these two years. When I first was reluctant to say yes to Pam, to take her to the convenience store for her special drink, I found that it was bringing me joy. Because every time I would go and pick her up from the community center where she'd been working out, and we would drive up into the convenience store parking lot, I saw a spark in her. And as we would get out of the car and we would walk in and she would go up to the cappuccino machine, the special drink that she wanted, and she would grab the largest cup that she could grab and the joy in her spirit of the simple little gift of taking her every week for that special drink began to feed me, to see her excitement, to see her joy, brought joy to me. And it was something that I continued to do until I moved here, that gift of joy. And what I know is that gift of joy is still happening as other people are now picking Pam up and taking her to the weekly community meal. And I bet they're making a stop at the convenience store so they too could get a spark of joy, the joy of giving, the simplicity of giving. Simple generosity grows big opportunities that benefit God's beautiful creation, humanity, and kingdom. As the Apostle Paul reminds us, the one who supplies seeds for planting, cappuccinos for drinking, I'm paraphrasing here, and bread for eating will supply and multitude your seed, multiply your seed, and will increase your crop, which is righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous in every way. Such generosity produces thanksgiving to God through us. Your ministry of this service to God's people isn't only fully meeting their needs, but is it also multiplying in many expressions of thanksgiving to God. Family of God, are we saying yes to the power of generosity?